Our learning objectives are to define infertility and the commonly used terms in the field, identify causes of male and female infertility, understand basic infertility evaluation, understand infertility treatment. We'll talk also about what the term assisted reproductive technology means. And lastly, we'll talk about the various expansions of IVF slash assisted reproductive technology that are becoming increasingly relevant. First, we need to define the concept of infertility. For women less than 35, infertility is the failure to conceive after 12 months of regular, unprotected intercourse, obviously without the use of contraception. For women older than 35, infertility is the failure to conceive after 6 months of regular, unprotected intercourse. The next term is fecundability. Fecundability is the probability of achieving a pregnancy in one single menstrual cycle. That is all based on regular cycles every 28 to 35 days. For the average couple, fecundability is about 22%. Not to be confused with fecundability is fecundity, which is the probability of having a live birth within one cycle. It needs to incorporate the possibility of miscarriage each cycle. For the average couple, fecundity is about 15 to 18%. And just to give everyone a good idea of what is normal and what is abnormal, 85 to 90% of couples conceive within 12 months of intercourse. That means 10 to 15% of the population is infertile, and that represents the commonly cited statistic that infertility affects approximately one in six couples. This slide describes the different causes of infertility. Of all infertility workups, about 35% of cases are attributable to male problems. That includes pretesticular, testicular, and posttesticular. We will talk about specific diagnoses in these groups on the next slide. About 35% of cases stem from problems with the female partner. We will also discuss this later, but the female causes of infertility are categorized by anatomy as you move up the genital tract. When you read about them, they are called things like cervical factor, uterine factor, ovarian factor, tubal factor, etc. Next, it's thought that 20% of infertility may be caused by things that affect both genders equally, like drugs, environmental exposures, and the deleterious effects of insufficient or excessive diet and exercise. And lastly, about 10% of infertile couples are ultimately diagnosed with unexplained infertility when all causes have been ruled out. It is a diagnosis of exclusion. These are some of the possible diagnoses in the spectrum of male infertility. Pre-testicular causes usually refer to problems proximal to the gonads. This usually means problems with the hypothalamus, pituitary, and gonadal axis, such as hypothalamic hypogonadism. Other endocrine problems, such as pituitary disease resulting in hyperprolactinemia, thyroid dysfunction, and exogenous hormone consumption like steroids and testosterone can also contribute to infertility. Testicular causes can be loosely divided into genetic and non-genetic problems, like Klinefelter's, for example, which is the most common genetic cause of testicular infertility. Non-genetic causes include things like drugs, infections, trauma, and varicoceles. Post-testicular causes are things that don't allow normal transport of sperm through the ductal system. These can be congenital or acquired. Men who are exposed to DES in utero, for example, can have hypospadias, cryptorchidism, or other blockages. Congenital absence of the vas deferens is sometimes seen with cystic fibrosis patients. Non-genetic causes are things like infections, surgery, and trauma as above. Female causes are a little easier to visualize, in my opinion. They are called factors, and this slide describes them as you move up the genital tract. First, there is cervical factor. This is usually as a result of stenosis that prevents sperm from reaching the egg in the fallopian tube. Stenosis can be a consequence of surgery, infection, hypoestrogenism, radiation, or even congenitally given. Uterine factor can also be congenital versus acquired. Congenital problems can be a result of Mullerian anomalies, which can affect the entire tract by either deleting or duplicating any part of the tract in both vertical or horizontal orientations. It encompasses anything and can be as mild as an arcuate uterus, which is just an extra bit of tissue at the fundus, so it makes the uterine cavity heart-shaped. On the other hand, the patient can have a vaginal septum, which creates two vaginal canals. Acquired causes of uterine factor are easy to understand. Examples are endometritis, which is an infection of the endometrium, not to be confused with endometriosis. 
Also, Asherman syndrome is an eponym for scarring of the uterine endometrium after a DNC that just doesn't heal properly. Fibroids can also cause infertility as well as polyps after an incomplete abortion or incomplete delivery. An endometrial polyp is an abnormal growth projecting from the endometrium that occupies space in the uterine cavity. Ovarian factor is the cause of most frustration and oftentimes is the hardest one to treat. This, as you imagine, is usually related to a woman's age and is a problem because women are just losing eggs all the time and it decreases the ovarian reserve. There are tests that you can use to check ovarian reserve like FSH and AMH, but no single test is a perfect test. Another cause of ovarian factors and ovulation can also result from other uh, interruptions in the HPO or hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. Other causes include polycystic ovarian syndrome and premature ovarian insufficiency, resulting in early menopause. Tubal factor is pretty straightforward. If a patient has a previous sexually transmitted disease, tubal surgery or ligation or other injury, uh, the tube is sometimes a reason why the egg and sperm can't interact. Uh, very rarely, uh, there are some reports that fallopian tubes can actually twist and you get a fallopian tube torsion, which then results in a necrotic and non-viable tube. Lastly, there is a broad category of peritoneal factors. This can be anything from pelvic inflammatory disease to adhesions to endometriosis. Endometriosis is its own lecture, but it is when endometrial tissue is actually found outside of the uterus. It's a pro-inflammatory state that is toxic to eggs and embryos, so it's not good for pregnancy, obviously. This slide is an overview of the causes that affects male and females nonspecifically. In the environment, things like radiation, lead, heavy metals, pesticides can all interfere with gonadal function. Drugs like tobacco, alcohol, marijuana can also interfere with sperm function and ovulation. Diet and exercise can also cause problems with the axis. When females exercise too much, they can have something called hypothalamic hypogonadism, which is where the entire axis slows down and they have amenorrhea and anovulation. In males, this may actually happen too, but it's not as clear. What may be the male manifestation of exercise is actually oligospermia or decreased sperm count. Obesity can actually cause the same thing as well. For the female, you need to pay specific attention to the OBGYN history. Starting with the gynae code, ask about their age, number of years married, any miscarriages or abortions, their parity, and number of children they have. Sexual history. You also want to know about a couple's sex life and ask questions about how frequent they're having intercourse, any lubricants, or douching. Any coital difficulties such as erectile dysfunction or ejaculatory problems. Ask how long they have been trying to conceive to establish diagnosis. Menstrual history. Also, you need to know about menstrual history and ask about what the patient's bleeding pattern is. Is the patient heavy? Maybe she has fibroids or polyps? Perhaps she's not bleeding at all and is anovulatory. If she has a lot of pain before each cycle, it may suggest endometriosis. Social history. Ask about the smoking and alcohol habits of both partners and their occupation as they may have been exposed to toxins or radiation in their line of work. Past medical, surgical and gynecological history. Has the patient gotten pregnant before? What has changed in her life between pregnancies? Determine previous infections, gynecological conditions such as endometriosis, procedures, and drug history. Also ask about previous fertility treatment and its result. To determine their safety for pregnancy, ask for any diagnosis or symptoms of diabetes and hypertension and aim to keep them under control before pregnancy. Do a quick gynae screen and ensure their pap smear or HPV tests are up to date. For the male, the questions are often not as revealing, but you should ask about any traumas, testicular surgeries and vasectomies, and medications or drugs such as steroids and testosterone. Also, ask about whether or not patients have fathered children before. But keep in mind that studies actually say that 2-4% to of patients actually have mistaken paternities. Also, ask if they have a history of mumps infection.
For the females, physical examination need to include an examination of the breast, abdomen, pelvis, and a general examination of the other body systems. As part of the general examination, determine the patient's body mass index as obesity affects infertility. Inspect for hirsutism and acne, which are common in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and look for thyroid masses. Chromosomal problems can oftentimes be undetectable. But these things can tip people off if they have syndromic findings of epicanthal folds, low set ears, webbed necks, etc. For breast examination, asking patients to express as galactorrhea may indicate hyperprolactinemia. For abdominal examination, inspect for scars which suggests previous surgery and palpate for masses. Lastly, the pelvic and speculum examination. Speculum examination is done to conduct a HPV or pap smear if they are not up to date with their screening. A vaginal examination and bimanual palpation is done to feel for adnexal masses, cervical excitation, and uterosacral nodules. For the male examination, it is similar to the female examination starting off with determining their body mass index to rule out Klein filter. Palpate for thyroid masses, inspect their chest for gynecomastia and galactorrhea. Abdominal examination to look for scars. Also, conduct a testicular examination, looking for varicocils and presence of vas deferens. Lastly, check the testicular volume and the presence of masses. When provider is testing for a cause of infertility, there are specific tests you can check to check a specific anatomical or biochemical practice. In practice, however, sometimes clinics will actually order all the tests at once in order to get answers as quickly as possible. Sometimes you only need to order specific tests based on the history. Without going into details, we'll just talk about how to evaluate each of the factors on this slide. To test the uterus, a hysterosalpingogram, or HSG, can be helpful. An HSG is when you inject radio-opaque dye into the cervix and take a real-time x-ray to look at how the uterine cavity traces out. It's also useful to see if contrast spills out of the tubes because then you can evaluate for tubal patency. Ultrasounds are also commonly used to evaluate GYN organs. It may be counterintuitive, but a pelvic ultrasound is actually better than any other imaging test to visualize these organs. A related test is actually saline infusion sonography, or SIS, where you fill up the endometrial cavity with saline to see if polyps or submucous fibroids are showing up more clearly. If you see something, you can then do a hysteroscopy, where you actually go to the operating room to put a camera in the cervix, look inside the uterus, and use instruments to cut or burn polyps away. MRIs or CT scans can sometimes be more helpful, but usually people only need ultrasounds. To evaluate ovarian factor, you need to do things like basal body temperature to see if a woman is ovulating each month. You can also check things like an FSH and estradiol level, as well as the AMH or anti-malarian hormone to see how much ovarian reserve is left. Antral follicle count is an ultrasound guided follicle count just to see how many follicles grow early each month and it can also be a major determining factor in ovarian reserve. Tubal factors can also be tested using an HSG as stated above or with laparoscopy. With laparoscopy, it's actually a surgery where you look at the tubes and visualize any damage or abnormalities that was inconclusive on imaging. Also, you can push dye through the cervix, and if you see dye spill out during the laparoscopy, that is called a successful chromoperturbation. For the male partner, there's actually a whole host of problems that can happen, but everything starts with one test, which is a semen analysis. A sperm analysis would be able to determine important factors such as sperm count, sperm motility and velocity, and look for any sperm morphology abnormalities. This is just an overview and review of terms that is used to describe semen. Azospermia is no sperm, oligospermia is few sperm, asthenozoospermia is motility less than 50%, teratospermia is abnormal morphology, hypospermia and hyperspermia are pretty self-explanatory. Treating infertility, if you think about it, is pretty logical. If you have identified the limiting factor, you just need to bypass that particular factor that's preventing conception. Some general measures are folic acid supplementation, exercise, having a healthy BMI, smoking cessation, 
and alcohol consumption reduction. For cervical stenosis, treat the underlying cause, for example, antibiotics for infection or intrauterine insemination. More elaborations will be done in the later slides. Treating uterine fracture depends on how bad the condition is. If it's something serious like congenital absence of the uterus, then that patient will need to talk about surrogacy using a gestational carrier's uterus. In case you're wondering, a surrogate looking to make money gets paid about $20,000. If the uterine problem is correctable, patients may need surgery to remove fibroids or resect some intrauterine scar tissue. Ovarian fracture is treated with medications that encourage a stronger ovulation response. You can do this with any number of medications like clomiphene, aromatase inhibitors, gonadotropins. Other assisted reproductive techniques can be considered if infertility is refractory to treatment. Tubal and peritoneal factors uh, can be treated surgically or actually by in vitro fertilization. If the tubes are tied and the leftover stumps are long enough, you can actually reconnect the tubes to allow for future pregnancies. This may unfortunately lead to more ectopic pregnancies. If there is something like a hydrosalpinx, those things are actually toxic to the egg. So, we're resecting those prior to having IVF cycle. It will actually decrease the inflammatory tissue and improve overall IVF success rates. The first option is timing ovulation with or without induction with oral agents such as clomiphene and letrozole. These are for patients with ovarian factor problems such as PCOS or irregular cycles. What happens is ovulation induction medications would be given if patients are anovulatory or await spontaneous cycles. This is followed by attending an ultrasound scan to track ovarian follicle growth at around day 12 of cycle. Once follicles reach 17 to 18 millimeters, they are then advised to start sexual intercourse. Next, intrauterine insemination with or without ovulation induction for patients with mild male factor infertility and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Similar to the first option, patients would have to attend an ultrasound scan to track growth. However, Unlike the first option, an HCG injection is given once follicle reaches 17 to 18 millimeters to trigger maturation and release of oocyte. Patient would return 36 hours later for insemination of prepared sperm sample from their partner into their uterine cavity. Lastly, in vitro fertilization, which is largely a last resort treatment and is for patients with tubal disease, low ovarian reserve, and moderate to severe male factor infertility. It is a very lengthy procedure, involving first ovarian stimulation, then follicular aspiration, then oocyte or egg classification, sperm preparation, oocyte insemination, and fertilization, embryo culture, and embryo transfer. That entire process takes about two weeks. Success rates depend a lot on age, quality of the embryology lab, and range anywhere from 35% for a young woman, and go down to anywhere from 6 to 10% for someone over 40. Quiz time. Question 1. What is the first-line oral induction agent used in artificial reproductive techniques? Question 2. What is considered infertility?